And uh, this lecture is tonight uh, because we have a small organization, it's a volunteer organization, called the Canadian Jewish Experience. And this is one of the panels that we created. Our entire exhibit consists of nine panels, and it's nine themes that we researched as part of the Sesqua Centennial. Uh, the exhibit is currently from coast to coast, coast, from Newfoundland all the way to Victoria. It is actually in Ottawa in three locations. It's at 30 Metcalf, which is two blocks from Parliament Hill. It's at City Hall and at the War Museum. And we are very much thankful to Chuck Friedman for offering this lecture. And I will not talk much more, but I will introduce to, to our MC, Canada's Rabbi, Rabbi Volka. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tova. The red blocks aren't always right. Uh, Tova, thank you very much for um, for for arranging this. Uh, when I got the note from Tova about whether I would uh, chair this tonight, I was um, you know my immediate answer was uh, was a yes. The, the first reason, of course, is because it's very hard to say no to Tova. <laughs> But it's also equally impossible to say no to a person that I remember from my, when I first came here uh, around 50 years ago, and um, the name Lou Rasminski was on the lips of so many people. He gave us uh, such a sense of, of pride. I, I remember, I recall, um, uh, you know, over the course of time I've met many outstanding individuals and Lou is right there at the top, and when you combine that with his humility, he's actually over the top. So this was an, uh, an, an obvious no-brainer. It's a great thrill, actually, for me to be able to be the MC tonight, and also a great thrill to introduce uh, Chuck Friedman, who has uh, many highlights in his uh, career as uh, worked at the Bank of Canada for 30 years, uh, retired in 2003. He was a deputy governor for 15 of those years. Uh, he's here, by the way, on a, uh, a happiness tour because he and David are just uh, coming back from the celebration of a bar mitzvah of one of their grandsons. So, Mazel Tov, you can clap for that, that's fine. Um, uh, he actually has been the um, a consultant for the International Monetary Fund before making Aliyah to Israel. He's adjunct professor in the Economics Department at Park University. And most important of all, he was a neighbor of mine for so many years. He and uh, Aviva and I got to know him and love him. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce you, Chuck Friedman, to talk about a memorable individual in our community, Lou Rasminski. Thank you very much, Rabbi. It's an honor and a privilege for me to deliver this lecture on the life and career of Louis Rasminski, a great Canadian and a Jewish icon. This evening, I plan to discuss Lou's role in the development of the post-war international financial arrangements, his career at the Bank of Canada that culminated in his role as governor of the bank for 11 and a half years, and his iconic importance and source of pride to the Jews of Canada. I'm delighted that Lou's son, Michael Resminski, and his wife, Judy, are here with us tonight. Lou's daughter, Lola, was unable to attend because of a long-standing previous commitment, but she will be, oh, there she is. She will be speaking to us via Skype a little bit later. And one of Lou's successors, as governor of the Bank of Canada, Gordon Teach, who is also seated in the front row, is here with us as well, and both he and Michael and Lola will make some remarks about Lou later this evening. I'd like to thank Canadian Jewish Experience and Tova Lynch for inviting me to deliver this lecture, the SJCC for providing a venue, Victor Rabinovich and Marie Malat for their assistance. And I'd also like to thank my wife Aviva for, among other things, acting as my editorial consultant for this lecture. <laughs> I would also like to note there is a full-length biography of Lou's life by Professor Bruce Muirhead. This book was very helpful to me in preparing my remarks and is ideal reading material for anyone who would like to learn more about the life and fascinating career of this great Canadian. Muirhead's title, Against the Odds, 
is an indication of the difficulty and unlikelihood of loose achievements in a more overtly anti-Semitic age in which anti-Semitism was a fundamental aspect of Canadian society. While it may be strange to those of us who grew up in recent years in a very open and multicultural Canada, there was a time not so very long ago that the notion of a Jewish governor of the Bank of Canada was very distasteful to some Canadians and to some politicians. We can be proud of how far we have come since those days. As you may already have noticed, I use the name Lou to refer to Governor Resminski, and will continue to do so throughout this lecture. This was the way he was referred to by his colleagues at the bank and elsewhere. And although he was a man of high status and very dignified bearing, he was also very approachable and much admired by his colleagues at the bank. Let me begin on a personal note. I first met Lou when I joined the Bank of Canada as a full-time employee in 1974. Although he had retired the previous year, he still had an office at the bank in the archives section, and I was fortunate enough to spend time with him over the years discussing various aspects of his career. He was a charming man, full of anecdotes, and happy to answer questions and to talk about past and future developments at the bank. I will share with you this evening a few of the anecdotes about Lou that I remember from those conversations. First, some facts about Lou's early life. He was born in Montreal in 1908 and moved to Toronto in 1913. He attended Harvard Collegiate in Toronto and was class valedictorian. Even in his high school years, Lou was interested and involved in Jewish issues and in Zionism. His first proposed topic for a public speaking contest for city high schools in Toronto was Theodore Herzl and the Rise of Zionism. And his second proposed topic was the right of self-determination of peoples. Both topics were rejected and he was disqualified from the competition. <laughs> Lou served its, as several senior positions in Young Judea, a Zionist youth organization. While in a position of leadership in this organization, he wrote that, and this is a quotation, it is tragic that precisely at this time, the Jewish youth should cease to be interested in its Jewish heritage and cut itself entirely adrift from any form of constructive Jewish life. He went on to emphasize the importance of education in preventing the weakening of Jewish traditional bonds. Lou entered the University of Toronto in 1925, specializing in economics, and was in a battle with Wynne Plumtree, who later became a top civil servant, to be the top student in the Department of Political Science and Economics. Plumtree won the Massey Scholarship for study in Cambridge, Cambridge, England, while Lou, with virtually identical grades, was left without a scholarship, and his family did not have the means to send him to England or the United States for graduate study. Fortunately, one of his professors, recognizing his ability and potential, approached the Jewish community to request that they provide Lou with the opportunity for further study. Within days, enough money had been donated to the University of Toronto Political Economy Department to establish a, stud a scholarship for study elsewhere, and Lou was its first recipient. Thus, in 1928, he went to England to study at the London School of Economics. While he never completed his thesis there, it was clearly a fruitful period, and he was able to meet and study with some of the great economists of the period. Two years later, in 1930, he married Lila and joined the League of Nations in Geneva after beating out 300 other candidates for the position. Lou excelled in the practical applications of economics, and in almost a decade at the league, was highly regarded for his technical work. He was able to meet many of the outstanding com economists of the generation during his time there. He also became intimately involved with the Jewish community in Geneva and in Europe more generally. Towards the end of the period, he helped Jewish refugees to escape from continental Europe from England and donated money to help them make the trip. Michael was born in Geneva in 1937. While Lila and Michael returned to Canada in 1938, Lou remained in Geneva until August 1939, just before the war. He then returned to Canada while initially continuing to work for the League. When he left the League, his supervisor wrote him, may I repeat now my appreciation for what I have always felt was the exceptional excellence of your work. The international experience and the expertise and contacts he had developed at the League would serve Lou well over the course of his career at the Bank of Canada. In the spring of 1940, Lou joined the Bank of Canada's Foreign Exchange Control Board as economic advisor. The board had been set up to deal with a wartime emergency, controlling the outflow of foreign exchange from Canada. Lou subsequently served 
in increasingly senior positions at the board. During the early 1940s, in addition to his work on the board, Lou was a member of a committee that was set up to plan for post-war international financial arrangements. This work culminated in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, a conference that set the framework for the post-war international financial system, including the creation of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And Lou was chair of the very important drafting committee of Bretton Woods. It is this part of Lou's career that we now turn. I once asked Lou how he, a relatively young man, had come to be named the chair of the drafting committee at Bretton Woods. He explained to me that while the war was still raging, a number of countries began to focus on the kinds of arrangements that would stabilize the post-war international financial system and help avoid the policy mistakes that exacerbated the Great Depression, most notably exchange rate policies and tariff policies. There were only three countries who were doing serious thinking about the subject, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. Wu was involved in many international meetings on the subject, and his understanding of the issues and his insightful contributions in planning meetings led to his being invited to chair the drafting committee in 1944. While the international discussion of post-war financial arrangements, which began in 1942, aimed at international collaboration, establishing rules of behavior, substantially different views as to how to achieve these goals were initially taken by the United States and the United Kingdom. Lou acted as the consummate mediator between the two countries over the two to three years needed to establish the rules of the post-war financial system and to set up the IMF and the World Bank. Because of his superior technical skills and because he had a better understanding of the American political situation than did the British, he was able to understand the limits placed on the American negotiators by their domestic political situation while also understanding the needs of the British in the post-war period. Let me provide one example of Lou's role. Canada developed a plan which was introduced at a meeting in Washington in June 1943. At the end of a very long afternoon with rambling and diffuse discussion, Lou was asked to summarize the points made. He proceeded to provide an analytic summary of the discussion that lasted for 15 to 20 minutes and that terminated in spontaneous applause lasting another two minutes. In the negotiations leading up to Bretton Woods Conference, and at the conference itself, held in a hotel in New Hampshire in July 1944, the American delegation was headed by Harry Dexter White, and the British delegation was headed by John Maynard Keynes, one of the most important economists of the 20th century. As negotiations continued, there was a clash of personalities between White and Keynes. It was not clear whether an agreement could be reached. As David Dodge, later governor of the Bank of Canada, has written, Bresminski played an important role, formal and informal, at the talks. Not only was he the chair of the drafting committee, he was also the peacemaker between the British delegation and the US delegation in the months leading up to Bretton Woods. It was Bresminski who kept the two key delegations talking. Without his work, both as a skilled drafter and as a go-between, it's entirely possible that the talks at Bretton Woods could have ended in failure. Some further examples of Lou's roles and comments, by some, and comments by some of his contemporaries are of interest in this context. Sir Roy Harrod, a leading British economist, wrote, almost alone, outside the ranks of British and Americans, the Canadians seemed capable of understanding the international monetary problems as a whole. Their suggestions were intelligent and creative, and the British and Americans were always anxious to have them. A member of the Brazilian delegation of Bretton Woods commented on Lou's role in, as mediator between Keynes and White. He could talk back to Keynes. He was bold enough to discuss with him and contradict him and had a much better view of the American position. Of course, he was much more than a mere mediator. He had credibility among the participants because of his obvious technical skills and his impartial and objective approach. Eddie Bernstein, a key member of the US delegation at Bretton Woods, commented that Bretton Woods lose major roles making sure that any continuing arguments between the United States and the United Kingdom didn't stop the conference from getting the IMF created. In his subsequent visit to Ottawa, Lord Keynes, John Maynard Keynes became Lord Keynes, told the Ottawa Citizen newspaper, Canada played a very distinguished and dignified part all through Bretton Woods. Your Mr. Resminski rendered most Trojan service as chairman of the most important technical committee at the conference. There's tremendous assistance in that connection brought results which satisfied all concerns. A member of the Netherlands delegation said of Lou that he was brilliant. And a member of the US Federal Reserve Board 
noted that Lou should have been named the IM's first managing director. So great was his impact in 1934. <coughs> Very high praise indeed. Lou also wrote an article entitled International Credit and Currency Plans, which appeared in the July 1944 edition of the prestigious U.S. periodical Foreign Affairs. Harry Dexter White, the head of the U.S. delegation, asked Lou for 100 copies to distribute, while Keynes spoke of it in highest terms. With regard to this article, Lou once told me that one morning, as he left his bedroom at Bretton Woods to, at the hotel to go to the general meeting of the delegates, he met Lord Keynes, coming from his bedroom. Keynes commented to Lou at, on how much he had enjoyed Lou's article and how he had planned to write Lou a note to that effect, but that writing such a note would make him late for the meeting that morning. As Lou told me, what he really wanted to say to Keynes was, why don't you back to your room, write the note, and arrive a little late to the meeting. <laughs> in this case, as in so many others, Canada punched it above its weight and played the honest broker role. Its ability to play such a role was based on the intellectual capacity of its representatives and their understanding of the issues and pressures of both sides. In the midst of all this, Lola Rosminski was born in 1944. In 1943, Lou was appointed executive assistant to the governor of the Bank of Canada. His work over the rest of the 1940s and through the 1950s involved watching over developments in international cooperation and reconstruction on behalf of Canada at the Bank of Canada at the IMF and at the World Bank. That is, in addition to his work at the Bank of Canada, Lou was also Canada's executive director at the IMF between 1946 and 1963, 62, and the World Bank from 1950 to 1962. The three positions that he filled by himself subsequently required three people to fill. From the Canadian point of view, the major financial development over that period was the floating of the Canadian dollar in September 19. We now turn to Lou's career at the Bank of Canada over the years following Bretton Woods. On three occasions, Lou did not receive the promotion that many people thought he should have had. The first came in 1949, when Donald Gordon had held the number two position at the Bank of Canada.